Dr. Lauren Lownan, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about antibiotic resistance gene typing from whole genome sequences. More specifically, I'm going to introduce you to the idea of what antibiotics are and what antibiotic resistance are, and I'm going to um, close by describing briefly one method by which you can take whole genome sequence data and you can um, determine whether an isolate or set of data that you have contains antibiotic resistance genes. So first let's talk about antibiotics. Antibiotics are biological or synthetic chemicals that can kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria within a living host. And usually we're talking about humans, but this might also be, for example, your dog, if your dog's got an infection, or your cat, or a cow. Um, most antibiotics are produced by microbes, although many of them are then altered chemically to work better. So when we utilize antibiotics medically, we're generally harnessing something that evolved in nature that um, microbes use either for the purpose of communicating with other microbes or killing neighboring microbes in order to outcompete them. These were discovered and documented first back in the 1920s by Alexander Fleming. He had left a plate um, that had um, Staphylococcus bacteria growing on it and um, gone away on vacation and he came back and he noticed that there was a, the growth of a mold colony, mold from the genus Penicillium, and that all around that mold colony um, there was what is called a zone of clearing. And that zone of clearing was due to the mold producing an antibiotic, which we now know to be the drug penicillin, and that lysing and killing the bacteria that were growing on the plate all around it. And you can see that a little bit better on this particular plate because the organisms, the bacterial organisms, have been streaked really to grow really thickly or with confluent growth. And here's the fungus and it is secreting an antimicrobial compound, penicillin, and that penicillin is resulting in a zone of clearing all around this mold colony. And this is how antibiotics were first discovered, although they tr the production of antibiotics by microbes is most certainly far more ancient than just dating back to the 1920s. Today we have literally hundreds of different categories of antibiotics that can be used medically. And um, there's some patterns to them. So for example, some of them are what is called bacteriostatic, which means they restrict growth and reproduction in bacteria, while others are actually bactericidal, meaning, meaning that they cause bacterial death. And there are, chemically, there are patterns within microbes. So the beta-lactam groups all contain this beta-lactam ring in their structure. They were the first group discovered because penicillin contains a beta-lactam ring. Any of the isillins contain lactam uh, rings. The aminoglycosides were then discovered later. Then chloramphenicol, and also the, the tetracyclines. The macrolide antibiotics were discovered back in the 1950s. I missed the sulfonamides, which were discovered in the 1930s. Um, glycopeptides, um, ansomycins, and spe spectro, uh, sorry, streptogramins. Um, lipopeptides, quinolones, and oxalolinodones. All of these are different categories that can be distinguished on the basis of their structures, and those structures will affect microbes in different ways. Some will kill some kinds of microbes, and some will kill others. Some are good at killing all different sorts of microbes, and there's a lot to be learned about that that I will not be getting into here. So antibiotics will all, however, target some specific aspect of a bacterium. So for example, the fluoroquinolones, um, they target DNA or RNA synthesis. The beta-lactams and vancomycin target cell wall synthesis. Trimethoprim and the sulfonamides target folate synthesis. Daptomycin targets the synthesis of the cell membrane. And the tetracyclines and these other drugs target protein synthesis. And so the way that these antibiotics kill or inhibit bacteria is by disrupting the cellular processes that bacteria need in order to survive and to grow or replicate. So how does a bacterial cell fight back against these compounds? Well, 
they fight back through the process known as antibiotic resistance. And it will also be something very specific, and it will be mediated by specific proteins and genes. This figure shows some of the major categories of antibiotic resistance. So for example, the bacteria might synthesize efflux pumps. And efflux pumps are proteins that would be parked in the membrane of the bacterium. They would span the cell envelope, so that would also include the cell wall shown in a rust color here. And if this pump is able to pump out the antibiotic as fast as the antibiotic is coming in, then the internal concentration of the drug never becomes toxic and the bacterial cell survives. You could also have immunity or bypass proteins. So for example, you could have proteins that modify um, or alter the, the, um, the biochemical process that is being disrupted by the antibiotics so that the cell kind of comes up with a workaround to it, like another way to make folate, for example. You could have inactivating enzymes, so you could degrade the antibiotic and make it inert or non-toxic to the bacterial cell. Or you could modify where the antibiotic binds to the target in the bacterial cell. So there are a number of different mechanisms for antibiotic resistance, and they are all um, the result of having particular proteins and therefore having particular genes or alleles for particular genes that confer antibiotic resistance. And collectively, those genes are described as being antimicrobial resistance genes, or AMR genes. These resistance genes can be amplified in a population. So you can have just one or two copies of them, and then those genes can be spread through a population so that you get a much higher frequency of those alleles. And this is, in fact, a case study for natural selection. So if you have a population of organisms and you have just a handful of those organisms containing genes for drug resistance, if the environment changes such that the population is exposed to a lot of antibiotics, so maybe this environment is the bacterial community in your gut or in a wound, and then you take antibiotic drugs to combat an infection in that wound, and then what happens is now you've bathed the environment in antibiotics, and that has created a selection pressure. And so what will happen is any organism that lacks those resistance genes will be selected against. So you'll have differential survival and reproduction because the antimicrobial resistance gene com containing members of the population will survive and they will they will multiply and you'll see an increase then in the frequency of those genes. So that's kind of like the simple case study for natural selection. Then add into it the fact that um, anytime a microbial cell goes through uh, cell reproduction, they transmit those resistance genes, but also many of the genes in bacterial populations can be spread through horizontal gene transfer through the processes of conjugation transformation and transduction that allow genes to be shared or passed to members of the community in ways other than a parent to offspring transfer. And so in that way, you can see any antimicrobial resistance genes or AMR genes moving around in the environment and they can get into non-pathogens who can serve as reservoirs and they can move from environmental reservoirs into non-human animal reservoirs and then into humans and this has been well studied for a lot of different AMR genes for example there's been a lot of work done on the pathogen Klebsiella pneumoniae and it's been well documented that strains of Klebsiella pneumoniae can acquire AMR genes um, that are carried on plasmids and those plasmids can be found in the environment and in host animals such as agricultural animals in the microbes that are found in those places and that these genes can kind of move back and forth. So we, we really are, um, it is really very possible for the bacteria that are found on and within humans to acquire genes from bacteria that are in other animals and in the environment generally speaking. So because of this, it's really, really important to know what the total gene pool on the planet is for AMR genes. There, there is a direct 
um, relationship to having that knowledge and being able to protect human health. And just a little bit of predictive modeling in this that might be a little bit scary, but if you look in blue, all of this is data from, I think this data was from last year, and it looks at, at um, cause of deaths due to antimicrobial resistance um, contain, gene containing pathogens, as well as other causes of death. So we've got like road traffic accidents killing 1.2 million people. We've got measles killing quite a few people. We've got tetanus killing quite a few people. Diarrheal disease due to a variety of microbial pathogens. Diabetes is not a, um, an infectious disease, but it does kill a lot of people. Cholera kills a lot of people. Cancer, one of the leading causes of death right now. And um, just recently, um, AMR uh, gene-containing pathogen caused you know, just short of um, a million deaths planet-wide. At the current rate of increase in these sorts of infections, infections due to pathogens containing antimicrobial resistance genes, if we don't do something about it, we're going to start to see a lot more deaths due to those kinds of infections. And if the trajectory continues, then in 2050, this will actually be one of the leading causes of death, um, you know, barring other unanticipated changes. So it's really important to know if the pathogen infecting a person is, um, contains AMR genes. And so when you're infected with a bacterial pathogen, if that pathogen has been isolated and worked up and studied in the lab in order, to, in order to make a more informed decision about what sorts of antibiotics you should receive, then there are a variety of tests that can be done where the bacterium is grown up and then it is exposed to different concentrations of antimicrobials to see if there's a concentration that's effective in killing the pathogen um, and at what concentrations you won't see any effect at all. And this disc over here has been soaked in some sort of antimicrobial compound or antibiotic that is not killing the pathogen at all. So this pathogen is totally resistant to that. Whereas the drug that this compound, uh, this filter has been soaked in, is clearly working. There's a zone of clearing around it. So that's something we can test for and monitor for. We can also monitor all of the different bacteria that we sequence for the presence of AMR genes, not just the bacteria that are pathogens, but data sets from all different sorts of bacteria. And we really have a fantastic opportunity to do that now in the post-genomic uh, world where we have access to tens of thousands of sequenced data sets, both genomic and metagenomic. And so what we can do is we can get DNA reads from genomic or metagenomic data, and then we can align those reads to known antimicrobial resistance genes. This OXA320 gene is an antimicrobial resistance gene. And because in that data set, a bunch of those short sequences stacked up and mapped to this reference sequence, then that would be considered a hit. And you know that in this data set now, you've got the OXA320 gene, you know, 78 reads mapped there, and that enough reads mapped to fully cover the gene so that data set comes from an organism that has a complete OXA320 gene. Whereas down here, that same gene set, or that same uh, data set, when mapped against a different antimicrobial resistance gene, the OXA181 gene, we see reads mapping at this position and this position, but not in the middle. So the coverage was less than one or less than 100%. And that suggests that the organism from which this data is derived, they do have some of this gene, but maybe not an intact gene, and therefore it might not be functional, and this would require further study. So why would we characterize these AMR genes very broadly, including in non-pathogens as well as pathogens? Because we can get interesting information about the presence or absence of these genes in diverse bacteria thereby facilitating a better understanding of the total planetary gene pool for AMR genes so we can better assess human risk. A tool, there are many tools available for doing whole genome sequence mapping to AMR genes, but one of them that's quite handy is this tool called Kamer Resistance, and it's a tool um, that was developed by Clausen et al. And the reference, uh, if you want to take a look at that, um, the reference for that is shared here.
It's a tool that's hosted on a fabulous website uh, put up by the Danish Technical University Center for Genomic Epidemiology, and you can kind of Google this tool up pretty easily. The way this tool works is um, it's a Kamer-based tool, as the name implies. So this top part of the figure is what happens with a reference database of AMR genes. This bottom part of the, of the, of the figure is, um, apologies for that. Um, is what happens with the sequence data that you have that you are studying. So to start with the reference data, we've got a database that contains like all of the known antimicrobial resistance genes in intact sequence sets. We break that data up into KMERS and we hold it. Then we take the sequence that we're interested in, maybe it's a set of contigs that you have, for example, from a microbe that you just sequenced and assembled and you submit your contigs up to this KMER resistance platform and it takes those contigs and it busts them up into KMERs and then it takes the two and it sees where they match and it uses information that's been preserved on the database side to give you a list of what antimicrobial resistance genes that are known exist in your data set and that's kind of a quick screening tool but it's a really handy screening tool that can be um, used for all sorts of purposes. And that concludes this introduction to antibiotics, antimicrobial resistance genes, and the use of whole genome sequencing in order to screen for AMR genes. Thanks for listening.